Okay, good morning. Thank you all for joining uh, on this Sunday morning. Thanks for taking your time, especially during the weekends. And this has been a very volatile last few months actually for the markets. So we started this session, uh, this sharing session actually during COVID times. Uh, and then the market actually rallied and it, it, was, it looked settled for a while and then it's, it's back to its crazy best again. So we thought it's probably a good time to share some ideas and also understand in which cycle are we in, what should we do. And especially I think there is a lot of fear because there is a lot of losses in a lot of individual's portfolio and also through mutual funds portfolio. So today's sharing will hopefully give some clarity in terms of whether should we hold, should we put in more money or what is that we should do with the existing stocks that we have. So that is basically the idea of today's session. So as the saying goes, greatness begins beyond your comfort zone. Uh, generally, we are more comfortable uh, during the bull market compared to a bear market. So market does actually behave irrational on either sides, but we never bothered about on the upside, but mostly on the downside that we get really worried. So we'll see what is happening now. So probably most of you know about me. Uh, I've been representing AIA. I've been qualifying for the billion dollar round table for the last seven, eight years. Some of the best lessons are learned at the worst times, be it uh, uh, risk management or wealth management. If you ask somebody, the, the importance of health insurance is actually realized only after getting hospitalized in most times. or even the fine prints of insurance documents are uh, known only after getting into an hospitalization. So the same thing, you know, the moment you lose some money, that's when we learn in markets. It's it's not the other way around. And we think, you know, during bull market, everything looks good. So we will not know whether it's, it's right or not. Now we will understand where we have gone wrong. So the best lessons are always learned at the worst times. So... What are the investment options that are typically available? This is something I have walked through before, uh, just in case for the benefits of those who have joined newly. There are different op investment options, endowment plans, investment link plans, mutual funds, equity market, debt market, money market, fixed deposits, stocks. So basically we need to know as a fundamental uh, aspects, when do we invest in these things? Like for example, if I want to invest in mutual funds, is it a good time to put money in equity markets now? When is a good time to put money in debt markets? When is the best time to be in cash, which is like money market? What is the best time uh, to be in uh, fixed deposits, right? So it's, it's basically we need to know, and also the stocks, how do we choose stocks? Uh, can I just buy the high beta stocks based on the news? Can I buy crypto because everybody is investing in crypto? Can I buy Tesla because everybody is talking about Tesla? So what is the right time to buy these things, right? And what is the best time and what is the macro picture now? Because that is very, very important for us to actually know uh, where we are. So before I actually talk about what I feel, I would like to get some inputs. Uh, what is, how is your portfolio looking? Like, what do you feel? Do you feel it's the right time to invest? Do you feel you should exit because there will be more pain? or you want to hold on to your losses, what are you doing with your portfolios? Can anybody share what you're doing? Any thoughts from anybody? You can unmute and share. I mean, Pata, I think uh, it's a crash anyway. I mean, everywhere it is uh, red, I would say. Be it in Indian market or Singapore market. Yeah, it is red. It is red everywhere. It's a sea of red. But what do you do? Like if you have a portfolio which is down 20%, 30%, should you hold on uh, or do you basically put in more money or do you fear losing more and you exit? So what, what are you doing now? Okay. Um, basically, I'm stepping up uh, slowly. I'm not uh, I'm not putting all the uh, available surplus into the market now. 
generally i feel that it's not it's not worth exiting what we are already holding it's, it this is not making any sense now so basically i i think that like the market will continue to maybe around sometime it will continue to fall maybe i don't know whether that's bottomed out it may fall a bit further here and there and then it may stagnate stagnate there for some time before it start actually going up so it's, it's a good time for long term but we have to be very choosy if you are going in individual stocks uh, even if uh, one is going on a mutual fund then it has to be a slow approach or sip approach also can do okay thank you lakshmi so you are not uh, you advise not to sell because you are bleeding so much and this is the wrong time to sell yeah, uh, but you are not putting we, in more we, cash we should have sell, sold it in jan i mean that's what i'm saying you should have sold it in jan if we have not done it then i didn't do it so i, I don't want to do it <laughs> got it thank you so much anybody else what are you doing with your portfolio or, or even if you're not if you've exited uh so so nishan thinks market is hitting bottom it's a good time to invest great anybody else have any thoughts hi pata mohan here hi mohan hi uh, yeah so uh, i have uh, a significant losses um um i made a mistake of uh, putting a, a lot of money i kept it for house purchase i in stocks um rather than keeping it in the bank i thought i'll keep in stocks i'll get some appreciation but obviously uh, it crashed quite a bit um so i cannot exit now i don't want to exit um, i think the market will go up uh, but um, uh, there are some companies uh, the fundamentals were not the great uh, there were hypes and then uh, i bought some of them i think if your uh, portfolio uh, if you have uh, good companies and the fundamentals are correct you just uh, hold on to them i don't think uh, you should be selling it now um maybe if you have a uh, society you should stop buying that's what uh, i'm thinking but uh, obviously uh, um i'm not in the position okay got it thanks thanks mohan for sharing actually that actually raises another important point right uh, so if you need some money for something uh, at a certain point of time uh, we need not uh, actually wait till the last minute just to give you an example my daughter starts uh, going for college like in august september so at that point of time i didn't know like some months ago uh, what is a good time i mean where will she end up studying right it can be singapore it can be australia uk if it's australia uk then you need to basically uh, need at least some 40 50000 dollars per year so i want to at least have a minimum of one or two years of uh, fees ready right i don't want to struggle at the last minute and i don't want to the markets were really doing fine sometime last year october november right so i decided that that's something i always keep telling even even my clients most of you might have heard it like if you need money for your kids education you are starting a plan today if the plan matures in 10 years don't wait for the last month like if there at least 6 months before one year before if you think the time is good if you got recent returns always exit uh it's very difficult see entry is always easy we know market is cheap now we 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 know we have to enter now it's it's not rocket science actually but exiting how many of you would have exited actually in last not december january february right you will not actually believe that even if i go and tell people to exit they will actually look at me the same thing if i go and tell them to buy they will actually laugh at me it's the same thing but exiting entry at least many people will agree exiting is always a difficult thing so i exited my employee stock options of aia like sometime last year when it was like 90 dollars it was going very very strong and uh, uh, it made me regret because from when i exited at 90 it actually went all the way up to 110 then it bounced back and came to 76 77 so the point is exiting is always very important and uh, sometimes if you need that money especially over the next 12 months don't wait till the last minute and uh, you know exit probably when the going is good and forego probably one year of returns or something like that so that's uh, thanks for sharing anybody else uh, uh, other than lakshmi nishant and mohan would like to share what do you do what is your thoughts are you stacking up some very good stocks the fundamentally good stocks 
for example dbs is giving a yield of 4.8% at current price right so so like i'm not saying you go and buy now but i'm just saying there are some fundamentally good stocks that are available which will survive this uh, crash uh, so any other thoughts on mar- markets uh, where do you think like probably we are talking about recession okay. any other thoughts before i proceed okay if there are no more thoughts let me just uh, tell you what i am doing with my portfolio uh, i am also on the big loss because uh, there are two parts to my portfolio one is the mutual funds investment linked plans and the other thing is basically uh, the leverage trading that i do so i am because considering leverage trading in the market for us i am also sitting on loss but this time uh, i have decided whatever happens i am going to basically fund fund the margins that is required Uh, to overcome this phase because i know it doesn't make sense to exit right and also the fear is actually at the highest for example last friday the market again hit a 52 week low of s&p for 3260 and if you look at at that point of time hdfc bank was trading around 52 dollars microsoft was trading around 240 dollars uh, 242 i think it's very close to 52 week lows so there is a lot of panic out there right it's a real capitulation fed does just increase 75 basis points and to make it worse the next day all the fed speakers came and said they will they are considering 75 for july so it wasn't a feel good scenario but of course things have changed because uh, from the beginning my thoughts have been uh, i have spoken to a few people on this uh, i believe the fed rate hikes with the market projected of 4% is not actually supportive by the macro uh, data right if you look at the data on the growth side it's actually not very good so fed is fed was very late in terms of increasing interest rate they said it's transitionary it's transitionary and it will not pass on and then by the time they realize uh, what is happening in fact if you look at the interest rate differential between the actual interest rate the fed fund rates and the inflation rate it's actually the highest in us if you look at india the inflation is around 7.5% interest rate is around 6.57% but in us the inflation is around 8.5% the interest rate is still around 2% there is still a big difference there is still a lot of free money which is actually happening right so if you look at last week what are the changes that has happened is oil prices have fallen Uh, the pmi data is actually not very good and uh, the interest rate expectations have moderated significantly even though the fed has been saying 75 basis points so many speakers have repeated this week especially that they are looking at 75 some of the market has ignored and it's actually rallied up to 3620 to 3920 so it's basically a 300 points rally in the last 4 days on s&p so that is what i am doing i am actually putting in more money i am actually trying to keep my portfolio i want to give myself the best chance to recover the losses and uh, mutual fund if you look at it uh, for srs clients i at the time i have been advocating 100% into equities is around snp around 4000 4100 levels because to me at 4800 was always overvalued so when the snp at 4800 i mean correspondingly all the other markets and the asia has been underperforming for the last 2 3 years if you look at the regional equity fund china being the dominant player in that it china has been really underperforming equity markets for the last 2 3 years india has been doing well us has been doing well but uh, china has been china has not been doing very well so if you look at it china is actually on the other side of the macro right they are actually cutting rates they are doing everything to uh expand growth and uh, like once probably this covid zero covid is affecting them but once they are out of it uh, china has to go up and china is one of the growing economies in the world now so if you look at it on one side us is kind of hiking rates on the other side china is actually pushing for lowering interest rates and the money will start to go and because for the last 2 3 years uh, china has been down 30 40% so basically in terms of uh, valuations i always felt 3900 like where we are now is actually a fair value for snp and also for the markets so we are very close to it that's why if you see 3620 seems to be really oversold and there is a significant bounce the problem with this market is 
if you miss that one particular chance before you realize before you decide it's already up 10% so then you don't get a chance because you have seen something at 3600 last week so i saw microsoft at 242 now it's actually at 267 in the span of 4 days right so will i be comfortable investing in 3 days at 247 thinking it everything is over when i saw something at 242 it's very unlikely right so that's why we have to actually worry about we have to ignore market noises and be clear about what what we want to do in fact if you look at it i think everybody will agree war has helped russia more than anybody else all the sanctions have not helped so there was a lot of fear the currency went up to 120 now it's actually around 55 it's the best performing currency their exports have up significantly so again it does not work like what everybody anticipated so the markets can go wrong the markets can stay irrational on both upside as well as the downside but it's just that we have to have a clear uh, goal or clear decision making process in terms of what we want to do right so these are some of the the very important thing is in market correction is not permanent we all know right uh, i mean i've been in the market since 2005 or 6 so it's probably close to 17 years i exited completely before the 2008 financial crisis not because i knew there is a crisis i because i felt the markets are really overheated and it will fall so every time when the market is really overheated or oversold you just get some excuses for the fault so these are basically data which is more than 5% corrections for S&P since March 2009 and if you look at it now there are two types of corrections right one is the value wise correction one is the time wise correction sometimes what will happen is the value wise corrections happens very fast like suddenly the markets fall 10 15 percent and then it goes up once that correction every now and then market tries to remove the weak hands from the uh, investing uh, so a lot of traders get knocked out and and then it continues to rally but this time there is also a value wise correction there is also a time wise correction which is very important because time wise correction will basically uh, eliminate a lot of junk out of the markets for example a lot of these uh, companies which went up during COVID times uh, especially the FANG companies or the China based uh, dot com companies you know uh, the technology companies all these companies have fallen significantly so that's what a good time wise correction uh, does and and also what it does is it will help to recycle the markets so for example whatever the market leader last time may not be the market leader this time so it's again uh, pushes us to go back to the fundamentals macro will eventually catch up so that's what has happened if you look at it there was no macro a lot of stocks were going up uh, at one point of time uh, many might have noticed it there was a report it said the valuation of Tesla market cap of Tesla is equivalent to all the other car companies put together so if you just look at that report does it make sense do you want to pay that kind of a price right but people are still buying thinking no 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 Tesla will go well so now see what has happened so the excesses will the excessness will be taken out at some point of time right uh, but that is what is market has done we should take use of this opportunity to buy good quality companies so if you look at this fall basically 24.5 percent is actually one of the the biggest fall outside of COVID COVID was a very different thing because it's a very very unknown unknown we don't even know by everybody was looking at lockdown there's a complete halt of the economy there is so much of disruption everywhere but now what is the worst case interest rates can go up one percent two percent can it bring down the collapse of the economy it will increase the cost of most of the companies it's not going to collapse the economy like the COVID right and uh, recession is going to happen because of certain scenarios the recession is not like a recession like covid right so we have to understand so what is the perspective so we are not going to see a complete meltdown like a covid lockdown kind of a recession and uh, there uh, except for china i don't think anywhere else in the world uh, even if the covid situation deteriorates further uh, we are not going to see lockdown because people have realized lockdown is not the way to go right so considering all of that I think 
even if there is a restriction, it's not going to be as worrisome. And a lot of companies have actually grown significantly in these last two years. Uh, so we should basically start looking at uh, macros. So what is happening now? Uh, and just an update, most of you might be following these things. Most of the commodities like corn, soya, wheat, metals, most of them are down 20%. If you look at Tata Steel price, it's down significantly. If uh, They are just reported record profits and record dividends. But ever since the steel prices have started going down, so the PMI data in Europe and US last week was a disaster. And uh, interest rate expectations have moderated from 4% to 3.4%. And already they are starting off cutting rates after one and a half years, two years, you know, that will keep changing. So, and these are some of the returns of the stocks. If you look at uh, Facebook, for example, is down 51%. Netflix is down 75%. And uh, Twitter is down 13%. And this Twitter is actually supported by Musk's buyback, right? Otherwise, it would be down even more. So Microsoft is down 24%. Apple is down 25%. And there is nothing wrong with the businesses of some of these companies, right? If you look at Microsoft, for example, I mean, it's uh, every every sector, every department, Microsoft is basically firing an all cylinders. There is nothing wrong with any of the segments, the companies, right? And if you look at the last six quarter, they have actually beaten the estimates. And uh, just this quarter, they just moderated the expectations. They said instead of 2.35 on an EPS scale, they just lowered it by 2.32, especially on forex fluctuations. That also it's like very, very mild. Even assuming they do somewhere around 2.3 this quarter, so we are looking at close to $10 per share. And at $10 per share at 277, we are looking at 25, 26 times, right? So Microsoft has never been this cheap, if you personally ask me. So there is no reason not to buy Microsoft at 245, irrespective of what market does, because eventually it has to bounce back. So during COVID times, the stock was at 135. It bounced back all the way up to 350. The same thing with HDFC, which actually fell to $30. And then it bounced back all the way up to $70. So the money is actually made when the fear is at the highest. Because that's when people really capitulate and willing to let go of the stocks at any price, right? So a company which is sitting at a cash of $100 billion, imagine interest rate goes up, the revenues are doing well. 1% interest rate for $100 billion, what happens? It adds $1 billion straight to their bottom line, right? So there are a lot of opportunities and the, uh, use this opportunity to make big money because the best returns are made during the investment of the worst times. It might test your patience, it might go down, it might test your conviction, but if you have done your homework well, you will really do well. So NASDAQ historical returns, if you really see, like uh, from 2014, it's always plus, plus 19, 10%, 7%. So if there is so many plus, obviously the market has to correct at some point of time. That is what it has done. It's already down 30%. So that gives a reasonably good cushion, right? The last time when NASDAQ was really even down this much was in 2008, when it was down 42%. So the next year, if you look at the returns, it actually gave 55% returns. So if you look at it, nobody would have actually invested or even had the courage to invest after the financial crisis. But the best money is, like if you wait for things to settle down, if you invested somewhere in 2010, you would have probably made 5%, 10%, not 6% returns. But the best money is made uh, during these kind of times. So is S&P the same thing now? It's down around 23, 24% from the peak. And uh, if you look at the worst year, it's actually among the top three, four worst fall in history, right, since last 60 years. So this is just to give you a perspective of what happens in history, what are the lessons we should learn from the past corrections. And every time it's different, but we, we should just have a perspective. And the one thing we should always realize is macro does catch up eventually. It might not catch up in three months, six months, but eventually it will catch up. Sometimes it will catch up in one month, sometimes it might take a year, but eventually macro does catch up with the stocks and the indices. So any questions so far? Is it clear? But the worry is uh, when do you buy it? So obviously, you know, we try to do uh, uh, DCA. So for example, uh, the market does, markets are melting. So 
So I thought I'll buy PayPal. PayPal was going for uh, 260, and then uh, I bought at uh, 130. I thought it's great. I got a very good price, and then it's now sitting at uh, 70 or 80. So um, it's difficult to predict uh, when to enter again. Correct. I'm, I mean, I'm not sure about PayPal, but maybe I'll take a couple of examples I'm familiar with, for example. When to buy is a very good question, and how much to buy, what to buy. So I always say there are two kinds of, uh, two modes of investments, right? One is dollar cost averaging, another one is lump sum investments. You do dollar cost averaging when things are uncertain or when things are like you don't know you know if it's it'll go up or if the valuations are very high that is when you do dollar cost averaging and uh, before i get into the specifics of when to buy so you always do a dollar cost average for example last december when i met a lot of people uh, i said the markets are kind of overrated personally to me if you're investing but at the same time you don't know when it will correct so either you be very conservative or you do a dollar cost averaging program, but you don't do a lump sum program. So we started with the dollar cost averaging program uh, or a conservative approach to markets, right? Then the conservative became balanced somewhere when the S&P fell to 4,100, 44,000. But then it has fallen even some more, right? So, so if I go and tell the person, oh, it has actually fallen from the levels that you've actually recommended, but see, we can't time the market to perfection. But what I know for sure is 3900 is a good price. Even if it goes to 3200 tomorrow, the market one year down the line will be much more than 3900 because if you look at the peg ratio for S&P 500, it's actually less than one. In fact, the S&P 600 price to earnings growth ratio is 0 0.7, which is one of the lowest. See, during past corrections, the market's valuations are always expensive. But now it's not the case. If you look at the trailing 12 months PE of S&P, if I read somewhere, it's probably around 13 or 14, which is not too expensive. So this is a great time for me to basically enter. I would not worry if I have bought it at 3,900 or 3,700 because I know for sure even if it goes to 3,200, 3,900 is a good price. So let me give you a specific the PayPal I don't follow, but I'll give you examples from what I follow. The two stocks I really have a lot of questions basically personally is HDFC Bank and uh, what is that? Microsoft. And let's also take a couple of dividend paying scripts in uh, Singapore. So DBS was actually at $37 at some point of time and now it's actually at $32, $30. So if I want to buy DBS today, the only thing I got to worry is will they be able to actually pay the dividends. I mean, historically, the way you look at it, unless something disastrous happen, they will continue to pay the dividends. So does it matter if the stock goes to 25 because at my current price, the yield is 4.8? I don't really care, right? So I just go and buy. The same thing, Keppel Infrastructure Trust, they are continuing to pay a very good dividend. In fact, I've been holding from 42 cents. So and during the COVID crash, it came all the way to 35. If you if you honestly look at the business model, they will have some bleeding this time this quarter, especially with the high oil prices, because there is a lag effect in collecting the money because the electricity rates have to be increased, and by the time you, you know it's not a direct correlation, right? Sometimes it takes effect, but there will be at least some next one or two quarters they might be hit in that segment. But the reality is, in six months down the line, anyway they will actually collect that money. It's just that sometimes there is a lag. Sometimes they get the benefit of falling oil prices. So it's a cyclical stuff, but uh, they are not losing money. Like, you know, unlike India, where sometimes the government intervenes and uh, you know, stops them from increasing the prices. So in those cases, I don't worry because I know what is going to happen with the script. The fundamentals are intact, right? So I don't mind. I don't care about the price movements. The same thing, let's take Microsoft. Microsoft, my first entry was around $300. So $300 it corrected from 349 to 300 right the same thing like what you said oh it's corrected 15 percent the company which is growing so well and if you look at the way they are catching up with amazon they are still a distance second there is no doubt about it but they are doing better than anybody else in the cloud business other than amazon and they are really catching up and 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 they the way they moved to the office revenue model annual model is phenomenal in fact a has actually moved from google suit to microsoft for their entire port, uh, the portal so 
I quite like the business changes that have been done. I've been a big fan of how they are actually beating the estimates, you know, for the last so many years. And uh, I looked at the numbers. I said, okay, they will end up doing ten dollars. Probably it's thirty dollars. Maybe thirty is slightly more expensive. But sometimes good companies, you have to pay a price. Maybe you'll forego one year of return, but subsequently you'll grow at twenty-five percent. Then the stock came to 270. I added more at 270. Then it came to 240. I added more at 240. Can it come to 200? It can come to 200. We can't say for sure. But the thing I keep asking is, can the earnings per share come to eight dollars from ten dollars? Which I think is very, very, very unlikely, right? So then it does not matter what is that the price is the price is going to do. You just have to hold on because you know for sure it'll recover. It has recovered from COVID times from 135 to 350. The same thing I'll take with the HDFC Bank. HDFC Bank's earnings per share was like 70 rupees last year. Now it's around 1,400 rupees, the stock. If you go and look historically the valuation of HDFC Bank, it's never been less than 30 times from what I know. And sometimes these stocks are so good, like a company like Microsoft or HDFC is never valued on tailing 12 months. It's always on the uh, forward uh, uh, PE. So if you look at 70 rupees, if HDFC grows at 20%, which is quite likely if India continues to grow at 7.5-8%, I will not worry if the HDFC falls to 52 or 45 because I know for sure it will bounce back. So. This is the kind of analysis. I'm just taking PE just as an example, but there are other parameters. But this is the simplest thing. Like, for example, price to earnings growth ratio. As long as it's greater than one, it's less than one, they say it's very attractive. Sometimes it's okay, you know, for to pay a premium for big blue chip companies because you might forego six months of returns, but eventually you will catch up in the subsequent years. So that is how I actually buy when I choose a stock. So I don't follow PayPal. So uh, this is the kind of homework. So the price alone, for example, Tesla has fallen. The P is still 95. Am I comfortable? I'm not comfortable even though it has fallen so much. The same thing with Zoom, right? Zoom at least makes sense. But some of the other companies, like the earnings are not even there. So the question we got to ask is what is the fundamentals, right? What is the book value for some of these companies? Like Paytm has fallen probably 70% from the IPO price or something. It still doesn't have a good revenue model, right? Yesterday I saw Zomato buying some other company which is churning more cash. So there are a lot of these crazy things which happen in the market. So as long as you have done your homework, uh, which I'm sure you would have, then don't worry about these prices because the market is very, very irrational now. In fact, when the merger news was announced for HDFC Bank, the stock went up to $70, 1,700 rupees in uh, India, right? Now it's actually at 1,300. Then because they are saying, oh, there are some concerns with the merger. And if you look at the annual report released by the CEO of HDFC Bank yesterday, he said this is a phenomenal time for them to do the merger because the economy is really, really taking off. And if you look at Indian growth, there is an unprecedented amount of demand for home loans in India. And HDFC is the market leader. Second thing, the market share of HDFC Bank as a whole in India has increased slightly compared to last year. So there is an increase in loan dispersal. There is an increase in market share. Plus 70% of the HDFC home loan guys, they are not doing business with the bank. So they are saying every five years once, they will create another HDFC bank going forward for the next 20 years. Let's assume, uh, you know, e even, if the, even if the stock is at 1,700 or 70 levels, this uh, looks so attractive, right? If the HDFC bank can create another HDFC bank in the next five years, and if you trust the management which has delivered for the last 30 years, I would not worry about the price now because I know for sure eventually it will catch up. But now, not only that, even if it's at $70, I don't mind buying, but actually I'm getting at a price of $55 where they are saying they will actually create a HDFC every five years once. So you're looking at the returns of 15, 16%, right? See, once market normalizes, once market normalizes, and the market realizes, okay, it's not as much as a fear in terms of merger, the requirement. 
believe me hdfc will be start to valued at forward pe not trailing pe so the moment it's valued at forward pe with the premium let's say for example oh hdfc deserves a 30 times valuation on next year's earnings which will be around 85 rupees just imagine what it, what could be the gains you can actually double in one year's time right so that is what i'm looking at it will it eventually happen it will catch up with the macro eventually i don't know when it will happen but it will sure for happen uh, so that i need not worry about that so as long as you have that kind of a conviction with the stock that you buy i think uh, we need not probably worry about the prices what i so you got to figure out for example what can uh, the thing i keep asking is what can bring down the revenue of microsoft or what can bring down the revenue of hdfc so 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 that they don't grow at the same level for me to basically be worried at the price right uh so the, the so as long as you have that covered i think uh, the price does not matter any questions anybody does that does that address like when to buy a stock or or basically how i buy a stock okay so as i said uh, it has uh, this market has given both time wise and value wise correction which is really good because it's almost 6 months now and the markets can stay rational longer than we stay solvent is a saying so which is actually quite true so it can really get worse because sometimes when people capitulate uh, there is no bottom right so that can still happen but you just have to hold on to it and as i said macro will catch up eventually so the one thing which always works is be fearful when others are greedy like there are so many people who are refusing to put money they are advising me not to enter the market so there is lot of fear which is out there uh, so to me it's a great time to buy in principle uh, to be very successful all you just need is it can be funds see sometimes people diversify with 20 30 funds you know eventually they will not do well because it's too difficult to manage i always keep telling even if this funds always have three four funds not more than that if you like india for example you don't need to invest in 10 indian funds at the end of the day you one might outperform this year one will outperform the other year but eventually if you get the cycle of up and down right you don't need multiple india funds if you are investing within india if you are investing in large caps you don't need 10 large cap funds just invest in one large cap funds that is good enough <laughs> because most of them basically follow the same nifty stocks and also the perceptions are very different right when uh, if you talk about growth like uh, now if you go and look at it 3600 people will give a target of 2800 for s&p and at 4800 there are so many targets of 50 to 100 for snp for the year end so uh, they, they are never right they are never wrong so difference of opinion it's what made the markets so the same perception the growth story will be magnified the same thing will be so fearful now so we just have to ignore the noise filter out the noise and take a right decision so some of the macro data which i think probably might help you so india is not definitely not going to recession if you look at the direct tax collection is up 45% compared to last year and also in india there is a structural change which is happening we when i went this time like every roadside shop also uses ap upi nobody uses cash anymore there is a lot of this uh, um, uh, the economy parallel economy is actually uh, unorganized economy is coming to the organized economy in fact if you look at the gdp numbers it's actually still below pre covid numbers last year but the gst collections are up significantly so there is more organized economy and also there is more tax compliance so things can only get better as the growth picks up and uh, singapore for example the exports beat the estimates for second month in a row the chip industry is actually the demand is quite strong but if you look at some of the chips companies you know like micron uh nvda they all have fallen like 40 micron has fallen from 100 to 55 dollars uh there is nothing fundamentally wrong with the demand it's only some supply chain issues but the demand is still intact so so these are good times to basically 
look at some valuations. Of course, I'm just giving an example because these chips are very cyclical business. So please be very careful. Europe, you know, we are the, the mess they are in right now. And India and China are projected to grow. So that's a good time to be in Asian markets this year. So I spoke about Microsoft, DBS, Keppel Infrastructure Trust, Infosys, HDFC Bank. These are companies like, uh, I'm not saying they are cheap now you go and buy today, but I'm just saying the perspective by which I buy. So the perspective, the reasons why I buy a particular stock. So w w what I see and why do I like it, the price does not matter because eventually you know macros will catch up. So the same thing with Tesla, Bitcoin, I don't know how to value that this is something we have discussed before. I don't know whether it's good or bad in Bitcoins. If you know how the Bitcoin is valued or any cryptocurrency is valued, for example, please go and buy if you're comfortable. But I'm not comfortable because I don't know, like I said, Microsoft will, will be 30 PE or peg ratio of less than one. There is something I can't uh, relate to with the cryptocurrency. So like Dogecoin, for example, is down 90% or 95% from the time Elon Musk announced this. So a lot of people bought, you think oh, for him losing million, two million is nothing, but for us it's a big amount. So we have to be very careful about uh, where we put our money in like if the market does get irrational either on upside or downside we know for sure it will catch up with the macro it will catch up with the fundamentals if the stock is for example let's take a good example Tisco right Tisco's valuation is like 2 or 3 P if I'm not wrong or 5 P which is very cheap or 5% dividend yields right but the biggest problem in cyclical companies is the revenue is not guaranteed for next year. In fact, it can it can be so that after an exceptional year, the next year can be lost depending on how much the price falls. So you can only buy if you understand the direct impact of the price of the steel with the company's turnover. So you cannot blindly go and buy because it's actually a 2 PE with the 5% yield because the revenue can go up, go down significantly. So the 2 PE can suddenly become 20 PE for a cyclical company, which is very expensive. So that's what we need to understand and avoid because what is the downside? What could impact their revenue basically? So these are some things we have spoken before. Uh, so start early uh, so that uh, you know uh, you have a significant advantage and also time in the market is also very important uh, so for example 10 years if you are in the markets so before that I'll you know all know the do's and don'ts so if there are any questions basically you can ask so why exit strategy is important so for example let's take you started this investment journey 10 years ago uh, so if you actually talk 10 years ago, if you had put in money, it's actually $120,000, right? So if, if you keep earning 6% returns, which is reasonably good returns, it comes to $160,000. Like let's assume the market has fallen like now. So if it has fallen 30% on a NASDAQ or 25% on an S&P, 30% fall from 160 is $48,000, right? So you actually going back to negative so that means a decade of basically earnings is gone so what happens is when that happens you lose interest you think oh I, market is not the right place for me and imagine if you're not even 10 years if you're only two years into the investments and 20 percent drop the drop is not just 10 percent on your capital it's actually much more right so it's very important Time in the market is important and also at the same time we have to understand market is the only place we make money but it's just that we have to make right decisions our entry and exit strategy should be right and uh, the mode of uh, entry like whether it is lump sum or SIP at the same time when you are exiting do you want to exit in lump sum do you want to exit in phases these are very important so entry and exit strategy nobody talks about entry strategy everybody says dollar cost averaging nobody says when is the right time for dollar cost averaging when is the right time to exit because even if you actually do dollar cost averaging 10 years ago if you don't exit now you might actually still be in the negative so their exit strategy is very important for both and this 
so these are some of the performance if you still see since inception in spite of all the fall regional equity has done 8.4 percent even though one year return is 23 percent so the longer you stay in the market it actually works out for you there will be times it will test your patience it will test your convictions the only thing is don't think that okay I will ride this phase I will wait for the market to recover then you put in money for example I'll tell you I had a very important discussion last week with one of my clients so he said uh, I'm not going to put in money because it was before the Fed uh, raised rates he said no the markets not going to go up anytime soon so I'm not going to put in money I will wait for the markets to recover then I put in money so that means you're okay to buy Microsoft at $300 but not willing to buy at 240 right but the thing is if it goes to 210 it will test you more like how many of you are ready to buy a property now right so if the property price is so high let's assume I am ready to buy a property at a 10 percent fall whenever the 10 percent fall happens it's not going to happen without a reason right it's not going to just like that fall because there is some excess in the system and it's falling it will there will be something which will trigger that fall of 10 percent so the problem what will happen when the 10 percent fall happens is we will we look at the trigger and say oh this has the potential to make the fall more than 10 percent so it can fall 20 percent so what happens now I am ready to buy a 10 percent lower price I will not buy because I think the trigger will make the fall at 20 percent so here the same thing recession is used compare the recession now which probably might happen to a COVID induced recession are these the same is there any rationality to my thought process but to take it's very painful right sometimes you you think you're rationally right you're logically right but market will test you that's fine as long as you get your data right as long as you understand you're right markets will eventually have to give you the gain we just have to be patient right so if you look at greater China it's also given 8.6 percent in even though for the last one year it's down 30 percent so the time in the market is very important look for long term this is a great time to me personally to invest in lump sum uh, so you, at least if not at least start doing your dollar cost averaging now because uh, if you enter right now that is the difference between a 4% long term returns and 8 to 10% long term returns so doing it once is more important do it right and also when you do it right so for example uh, my principle always is if I like Microsoft at 240 it's so cheap the same thing HDFC is so cheap at 52 if I am right it should actually make a significant difference to my portfolio right what is the point of being right but then you make five hundred dollars thousand dollars so I, I was so lucky I, I was so sure that Microsoft will reach 350 in one year's time so I bought 100 shares I make thousand dollars does it really help or ten thousand dollars does it really help no so you got to make the big decisions when your conviction is really high so that it makes a difference being right is one thing being right should make a difference so that is something you always have to be aware of so all the other things you know uh, so is there anything else that people would like to talk your experience your stocks or something that you would need to be addressed or is there any other fear or any other macro things that you think will probably uh, or that bothers you for example we spoke about DBS the same thing with OCBC and UOB Singapore Airlines for example the same thing there is a cyclical change I mean the fares are 40 percent higher compared to before or even sometimes it's double the price but people are still traveling right but at the same time the, this is a classic example so that means Singapore Airlines will start to make money but I imagine the money that has been pumped into Singapore Airlines right is it possible for them to recover the six nine billion dollars with this increase in fare over the next few quarters how do they repay this back so there's something I got to ask myself every time right so whereas DBS OCBC they are all actually enjoying this growth I mean uh, few Singapore there are like I was talking to a few of my clients they said it's so difficult to find a place in a restaurant during the weekends 
How many of you have seen big queues to get a place in a restaurant? I'm not talking just normal restaurants, even top high-end restaurants. You can't even get a reservation for the weekend. So that is how uh, booming the economy is, right? And every, if you look at it, there is a labor crunch in almost every services sector because they all have downsized it. So there are a lot of these hospitality sectors, you know, the Fraser hospitality, all these have to start doing well because the economy is basically picking up. But of course, different countries are on different cycles. We need to understand that. So, so referrals are the best compliment you could give me. So don't keep me a secret. Uh, and this session is basically about sharing. Please uh, share. Like if you have done some of the very good uh, additions in the last few months, it can even be exiting completely in January. Or if you had bought something last week, or if you're holding on to your portfolio, please do share so that more people are aware of it. And also, I would like some of the business owners, like you know or people who are working in these companies, for example, I think Nishant works for Microsoft, I guess. So to share, uh, like, you know, what do you see in the economies, right? What do you see in your companies, which, which you think is doing well? For example, my friend director is, in, is a director in Micron. They are doing phenomenally. There's nothing fundamentally wrong, uh, you know, with their demand. So something like that, any sharing will be really appreciated. Would anybody like to share anything? Just a question, about the, um on uh, taking profits. You know, I get the conflicting ideas um, when your uh, particular share is doing well, company is doing well. People say, take some profits, take some profits. But uh, people also say, don't sell your, uh, uh, you know. Winners. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's a bit difficult decision, isn't it? Um, so, for example, i tell you, uh, I was told that you should have at least one or two percent of your portfolio in uh, cryptos. So somebody recommended uh, me to buy uh, <coughs> um, this. Um, uh, what's the name of it? I've just gone down now. Um, Bitcoin. Uh, not the Bitcoin. Dodge. Uh, Ethereum. Uh, no, the one uh, from Korea. I don't know. She she moves it. I uh, know. Starts at uh, T. Um, suddenly, your name is Casey. Okay. So I bought for 500. Um, it went to 8,000. Okay. I find a dollar. It went to 8,000 dollars, and um, I thought I'll take some profit. But people are still buying at the price. People are still buying at the price. It is still going up. So no, that, no, that's what I'm saying. Like it's very difficult. Hindsight, I can say you should have exited at 8,000, right? I'll yeah. tell you an example. Like at TFC Bank, when it went to 72. I didn't exit, right? It was actually, it went up 20% just after, because we didn't expect the merger news to come in. Within like two weeks after I bought, the stock went up 20%. Suddenly the profit exploded, right? And then yeah. you become too greedy because they say don't sell the winners. Yeah. But then at, the, at that point of time, the question I was asking myself was, what is the valuation at 72, right? Mm -hmm. So th does it justify the valuation? So I felt like, you know, 72 might be slightly overvalued, uh, but, you know, when market uh, realizes the next two years going to be game changing for the company because of so much of potential due to merger, there will always be a premium, right? Yeah. Then that premium was got wiped out in just one week's time. Now it's actually trading at a discount to the news. So uh, that is the way we got to look at it, right? The same thing, Infosys was $26. But when it comes to crypto, where you pay big money, generally what I do, like for example, uh, even though I like Microsoft, like I've spoken so much, I like HDFC. But typically what you do in a bear market, you sell the rallies. Right. So for example, the Microsoft has come from 244 to 267. I am exiting slowly. Like for example, if I have 1000, I am selling 200 now. Right. So probably if it goes up another 20 rupees, 20 dollars, I will sell another 100 or 200, right? So because I, the fear that the bull, this bear market is not over, you know, it can probably go back to the 52 week lows again, right? So I don't want to basically miss that opportunity to take money. So if it doesn't go down, if it continues to go up, it's fine because I still have another 500 to make money out of, right? 
So you don't exit completely. So probably if you have 100 of Bitcoin, which is at 8,000, maybe exit 5 at 8,000. So if it goes up some more, exit some more. Like, you know, have a plan before itself. Like, for example, when you bought at 500, if somebody told you it will go to 3,000, you will say, oh, 3,000 is good, I will exit at 3,000, right? But the moment when you see 3,000, people will say it's expected to go to 20,000, for example, right? Yeah. I mean, some of the Bitcoin uh, price I saw was 200,000 or something like that when it was 60,000, yeah. right? So at that point of time, you st it's still three times more, right? So you think, oh, probably will I lose a lot more? But sometimes it's, it's about balancing between greed and also uh, the knowledge that the information that what we know and also the original decision as to why I bought, right? So to me, for example, the fair value for Microsoft is 33340. If the fundamental changes, the revenue starts to drop, basically I will have to exit even if it is at 300, right? Because sometimes uh, it's not justified. Yeah. So the way to book profits is possibly do some partial profit booking or, or whenever it, there is an excess, you know, that is the key. Like, yes, 8,000 can even go to 15,000, but do you really feel 8,000 is already super expensive, right? Like, 350 for Microsoft, maybe like Tesla, for example, I always felt expensive. I told so many people Tesla is expensive. But you can say Tesla is also corrected, Microsoft also corrected. You know, the argument still holds good. But I know for sure Tesla is definitely expensive, which will fall, but a Microsoft may not fall. That is the only difference. So in that case, what happens is when, when it is excessively valued, if it is irrational on the upside, you tend to take some profits. That's what we do with the SRS portfolio. We keep moving out of equities to money markets or fixed income because whenever we think the valuations doesn't justify, you know, like the markets are really overrated. So the, the best way to take profits is if you think, uh, see, I will tell you from personal example, 2008, I exited completely from equity markets. I didn't enter the subsequent because the rally was too fast. So I had to wait two, three years before I get an entry, right? The same thing in the SRS portfolio also, if you look at it, one of my clients even joked, he was pulling me saying that, you know, when the market was going up after COVID, we were actually, uh, many of you might know, when the crash happened for COVID, we were only in 30% in equities. So we actually had a good reason to get back into equities like 70, 80%, even though not full because the same fear. And then, but the thing was, subsequent pullback happened. We waited, we got only the first 20, 30%. After that, we started moving money into uh, fixed income because I thought, you know, the economy is still down, COVID is still having an impact. But the market priced in two years ahead already, right? So when those excess happen, if you, if you feel the market is getting ahead of the fundamentals, like Bitcoin might be a good story, but it, the story... It has the fair value is basically it will reach 100,000 in five years, but if it reached already 80, 90,000 now, it's probably a good time to exit. So that is what I will probably consider the time that you feel you don't want to be too greedy, the time you feel the valuation is already excessive, uh, the time you feel the business has changed, right? Uh, there is an impact to the revenue model, then probably you start exiting. Any any questions from anybody? Anything else? Uh, uh, please share whatever you have done, which is which is done well, so that people will actually understand. Or whatever you have done, which is not done well, so that you know people will also learn. So yeah, but I, I just uh, wanted to understand since we have people from different industries here about what they think is the current uh, state of uh, their business. Like, I mean, just, just to give my perspective on my business, we, I work for a luxury trading company. So we have seen that last two years, uh, supply was, was really, really a big challenge, I mean, huge constraint uh, on growth. And uh, it continues to be so even today. It's very hard to buy any products. But despite that, we see inventory levels have started to rise. So definitely, I mean, from, for our business, we're seeing that the demand is softening. And market prices also, which had really shot up almost like 30, 40% uh, across the board, 
they also seems to have peaked so we seeing softening in prices also so definitely there is a, there is a demand uh, is is not as good, good as uh, what it used to be last year even though the supply has not been able to catch up with the demand so just want to understand what's happening in other industries as well are they seeing some similar trends are there any cash flow issues they're seeing are we really maybe the maybe the peak inflation is already peaked and uh, prices are already falling if anyone wants to share yeah any any businessman would like to share uh, i'll just add a point here that's that's very important because see the moment market realizes uh, the prices are falling uh then automatically that's one of the first indicators right and the same thing once the supply chain slightly becomes better like people like our have an advantage because they can clearly see the very first sign of supply chain issues are being sorted out right and uh, if you look at some of the fall in commodity price the raw materials for all of these things is like a fall in 30 40% sometimes even 50 60% right so so the demand destruction is already affecting but that is the problem now like if you look at snp corrections a fall of 20% before 2017 18 it used to happen once in 4 years 5 years now it is happening in like in the last 5 years it's already happened four times so the cycles are getting much shorter and actually faster so if you think the market fall you wait for before oh the market has fallen 20% you wait for the bull market you make money after 3 4 years now it's not like that the 40% can happen in 6 months and then before you think oh you're good to go it will fall under the 20-30% so any any business owners who are seeing the impact or what do you think about the supply chain in the inventory any business owners here or like anybody who is working for the company also they can share like if they see a drop in demand on particular things that they do this is anna so i'm based out of the us and uh, i'm not a business owner but but i think what uh, the person was saying before is kind of echoing in the retail industry here like i think two weeks ago target and both walmart they issued warnings in terms of surplus inventory so they have to start giving discounts to get rid of that at some point which is going to impact their net cash flow and and profit margin which in turn would actually affect the stock price and the stock tank immediately like i think 10% that day when the news came out yeah there is a lot of uh, news about uh, inventories of the wholesalers in us so this is uh, shrini from us too uh, anand and i are living in the same place uh, uh what i am reading i follow very closely uh in the us i follow two shows one is cnbc half time fast money the other one is uh, cnbc um uh, closing bell overtime these are primarily the traders who manage funds they come in and discuss quite a bit um uh, not a single person that i watch in these shows for last about 4 weeks are have a clue of how the earnings are going to be coming out in the second quarter or maybe third quarter everyone consistently feels that uh, s&p 500 companies uh, the earnings are uh, uh, kind of um, right now at the peak they all think that the earnings will go up but they they are expecting a huge surprise and uh, future earnings growth might uh, slow down because of uh, the fed pulling the liquidity heavily the if you look at the money supply uh, in the us economy that was caused by federal reserve because of uh, bond buying and uh, interest rate reduction it pretty much though it was at zero 
it went to negative one and a half percent because they were doing bond buying. Now they are expecting that they might um, take it up to 3.5 percent by year end. Right now it's at about 1.5, and then in addition they are doing bond buying that may add about half a percent or one percent interest rate increase. So that would effectively take it to 4.5 percent. The net result of all this is a heavy reduction in money supply and liquidity is being taken out of the market. Once the liquidity is taken out of the market, they are expecting a lot of zombie companies to file for bankruptcy. They are worried about it. Uh, what are zombie companies? Zombie companies are companies that do not have even sufficient cash flow to service their debt. And they got cheap money at 1%, 2% for three years, four years, five years. And they could just, on a cheap money basis, they could just survive. But once their debts come due and uh, they have to refinance it at a higher rate of interest, the company will not be able to do it and they will have to file for bankruptcy. So Federal Reserve did a stress test on large banks. They are, con they are concerned about the failure of the large banks if things go bad. So their assumption was they did it at 10% unemployment in U.S. Right now it's at about 3.6%. And they estimated delinquency rate to go up they expected commercial real estate to drop by 40%. They expected residential real estate to drop by 28%. And they said the banks will even then survive. Uh, what I'm hearing is delinquency rates in uh, car loans and the credit card debts have started going up. They were extremely poor. Last quarter, J.P. Morgan kind of uh, 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 assumed they they released the reserves that was that was meant for delinquency rate they said we don't see as much so it's going to uh, we are releasing the reserves now this quarter we uh, they expect reserves for delinquencies to go up because there are a lot of subprime loans subprime loans are loans who are borrowers on the fringe and uh, uh, a small increase in um, in the in the in the interest rates, or they get a jolt in the unemployment. Uh, they they get fired from somewhere. They they're not going to be able to pay their monthly debt. Uh, there was another Wall Street Journal article which said uh, between last year this time and now individuals are spending $450 more per month on account of oil price increase, gas increase for going to work and back and all those things, and food and energy prices, which means people who are living paycheck to paycheck um, just trying to survive if they have to spend $400, $450 more per month for essentials, that comes out of their, uh, any other thing they are willing to spend is going to go down. And I'm seeing the inventories are building up because the retail and all other high ticket items are uh, slowing down. U.S. automobile sector average uh, uh, is around pre-pandemic was at about 16 to 17 million vehicles a year. The run rate right now in the auto sector is 13.5 million per year, which is far low because of the supply constraints. But they are expecting that even that demand will come down in the coming uh, in the coming months on account of uh, these uh, trends that they are seeing. 
the only positive uh, data that's coming out of uh, uh, Federal Reserve and any other thing is uh, about two trillion dollars in assets in the individual, uh, you know, bank accounts. But they said which might uh, people saved a lot more money during the pandemic and uh, because of the stimulus check payments and everything, which might cushion the consumer uh, behavior a little bit. Uh, but then if you do a deep dive analysis on the $2 trillion, the bottom 50% of the population doesn't have any cushion. Most of the cushion is with top 10% of the households with the net worth in top 10%. So if you essentially look at any which way the signals in the market, the market is more bearish. It is going to go down further. The general S&P 500 target in the market, U.S. market analyst, is the most bullish analyst is at about 4,700 by year end. And the most bearish analyst is around 3,000 in the year end. Morgan Stanley is saying around 3,000, 3,200, and uh, um, some of the individual analysts are going at about 46, 4,700 um, S&P 500. So the range is pretty huge. So if you really look at it, uh, what I have found um, is if you look at S&P 500 analysis from let's say in 1991, you have data on SPY, which is ETF for S&P 500. Um, whenever it touches or goes below 200 week average, 200 week, it bounces back very vigorously within next six to nine months. Only around COVID time in 2008, it went another 5 or 10% below um, a 200-week moving average. And you can pretty much, uh, if you look, I looked at 200-week moving average on multiple charts, JP Morgan, Microsoft, and everything. If you draw that over a period of 30 years, you will find Whenever it has for, for gone too far above 200 week moving average, it corrects itself within next six months or one year. And then similarly, when it goes, touches 200 week moving average or goes far below moving average, it bounces back uh, very vigorously within, within about six to six months to one year. One of the strategies that I am following is a hedging strategy where if my portfolio is managed by somebody else and I don't have control over that portfolio because they do rebalancing and everything, I put a hedge outside in the options market predominantly mapping to the, uh, to the instrument that tracks very closely to that investments that you've made. And you can do that only if you put it in broad ETFs or uh, broad funds that you can think of. There is another trend that you will see. The wheat prices have come down drastically. The lumber prices have come down by 70%. But so has the demand and housing. And housing is also going down. So uh, people are not expecting, at least I'm predominantly talking about U.S. because S&P 500 is being tracked uh, in the U.S. The housing market will be the last, analysts are saying that will be the last leg to fall. Before housing market falls, oil will drop down. By year end, they are expecting oil to be at about 80 and oil predominantly drives the headline inflation. Uh, Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell automatically said, 
oil and food prices are the headline inflation. If that goes up, it hurts more people. So we follow that very closely because that drives the consumer sentiment index. Consumer sentiment index is at the 40-year low from 1980 to now. Now, if you look at, uh, I've been watching some YouTube videos, you all can do a search uh, in YouTube. Jeremy Grantham, who is a, a GMO, very versatile investor, has been in investing for 60 years or so. He His, uh, all the speeches, and he has been super bearish for quite some time. He and a couple of stalwarts have been super bearish for a very, very long time, maybe more like a year, year and a half. And uh, his view is we are in a similar situation to 1929 where, you know, mm, the new instruments like cryptos and everything is coming into this thing. And then some of them are drawing parallels how long it took for the market to come back to normalcy after 1929. Um, almost uh, it took 1954 before it came back to the whole thing. Most of the analysts that I, I hear, they are all saying two big variables that are driving the market is Russia-Ukraine war and China COVID policy. They don't know when these two are going to help the economy to go, the supply chain to ease and other things. Another analyst who came in who I was reading or listening, he said, uh, right now though US, has, US and Europe have put embargo on Russian oil and gas, they have, they are still using and paying for it and they are phasing it out by June, July. So by June, July, about 3 million barrels of oil is going to come out of Russian. Russian oil is going to come out of market. And Saudi Arabia maximum has 1 million uh, barrels per day that they can produce the capacity they have. Still, there's going to be a short of, shortfall of 2 million or so. And if that happens and they, there's no way to fill it, then they have to soft pedal with Iran, uh, which they have been hard and putting sanctions on Iranian oil and Venezuelan oil, and they'll have to pump the market with that, those oil. And even with that, the shortfall will be felt in the world. Uh, so they, the short term, they're expecting um, maybe by September, October, November, they're expecting oil to showed up to 150 to 200. By then longer term, maybe six months, nine months, it'll come back down. And if oil goes up to that level, 150, 200, your inflation is not going to come down. And if inflation doesn't come down, Fed is not going to ease on the interest rate hike. And most of the interest rate hikes that Fed does is followed by EU, followed by China, followed by India. RBI has raised the interest rate twice in the last two months. So as the interest rate increases, there is money supply decreases and the economy starts shrinking. So that's what everybody is saying. That's what everybody wants. So in, in, in no scenario, I'm not seeing a huge upside in S&P 500, if that's what I'm tracking. And the individual stocks may be different. You know, they may, you, you have to be highly selective of individual stocks that will survive the downturn and be, uh, generate cash uh, further, even during the downtime and even later. So uh, you don't know how the whole thing is going to play out. So, I mean, this is just what I'm hearing. And Thank, I'm thanks, hearing yeah. thanks, for, thanks for sharing. Yeah, thank you. Anybody has uh, any questions, any doubts? I mean, uh, uh, with the due respect to all the reports that you say, I think investing could be kept a lot more simpler. Uh, we don't need to. Basically, it's, it's a common sense that if you look at it eight months ago, how many of these guys came up with the reports to predict that oil will be where it is? 
when oil went to minus it was at zero it went to minus 60 how many predicted that oil will be at 120 three months down the line right so investing is a lot simpler uh, to me with uh, I mean just follow some of the fundamentals like the fear will always be at the highest the market has fallen so much from 4800 to 3600 only because of all these factors and uh, nobody is going to come back and say oh things are going to get better soon because now you don't actually have a target if you look at the consensus target it's all like on the downside 3200 worst is going to come so, but at some point of time, this is not permanent, right? If oil, like, what is going to happen? Like, you know, the Fed fund rates, they said 4%. Now they already projected it to be downside. People thought 75 basis points will actually crash the markets, right? The Fed keeps coming and saying, everybody said, like, at least five people said 75 basis points next month, 75 basis points next month, the market has gone up 5%. So, uh, it's very difficult if you start looking at things like, you know, uh, everything, uh, there are a lot of negative stuff out there, but what is the price at which we are buying stuff? Be it S&P, it's like historical PE, growth ratios, there could be some earnings impact, and uh, the fear is at the highest at the bottom, it's, it's always a given, right? So we have to have a right strategy for that. For every price, for every action, there is a strategy. That's what we need to follow. So thank you so much for sharing. I think it will definitely give some perspective to people. So is there anything else that anybody would like to add or anything that bothers you that probably you would like to listen to? And Thank you so much. If there are no more questions, we'll, we'll probably catch up in a few weeks' time. Uh, hopefully, the market is much higher. We'll have probably more visibility by then than what it is today. And good luck for the investing. So do hold on to this. Don't, uh, I mean, sometimes, actually, sometimes you might feel, oh, I could have exited like now compared to two weeks later when the markets might be even lower. But uh, the good thing what they say is, in bear markets exit the rallies uh, don't exit completely like if you have thousand shares probably start with 50 if it goes because you will actually see some ferocious pullback rallies on bear markets which will actually trap you i'm not saying that you know this is the time where sometimes it can be misconstrued as oh sell the rallies because you will actually go down lower we don't know when it comes to market everything is uncertain but there will be some ferocious pullbacks, rallies in the bear markets. In bull markets, you buy the dips in bear markets, you sell the rallies. But that doesn't mean that you don't give yourself a chance to recover the losses. So if you're actually having a lot of questions, try to sell 100, 200. Even if you exit those and if, if, you, if you're fortunate to get it at lower prices, the same thing, you're actually at least bringing down your price lower. Uh, but don't panic because sometimes... Uh, the market today is a lot better because it's gone up 10% from recent lows. But 10% lower or 15% lower is when it will test your convictions. Today I'm sounding confident because Microsoft has come to 267. If it goes to 220, I'll be a lot more panicking. So take a right decision which you think probably keep some cash in case it goes down further. So trim your portfolio maybe by 5%, 10%, be in some cash so that you can take advantage if the market falls another 5%. Uh, so do what is right. If you need uh, some individual opinions, please feel free to ping me. Uh, whatever the little uh, knowledge that I, I, you know, if my sharing is useful to you, I'm happy to do that. And uh, uh, the, the, always remember when the fear is at the highest, that's when you get the best price. So thank you so much for taking your time on a Sunday. I really appreciate it. And thanks to all those who shared because... I think each and every thing is very important for people to understand. So thank you so much. See you all soon. Thank you.